Welcome to Silicon Valley Buzz, a TV show where we discuss happenings in this, the most fertile spot on the planet, for new ideas. I'm your host, Seth Shostak. And tonight, manufacturing in the valley. We did it once. Can we do it again? Is there a future for manufacturing here? Tonight, we'll be talking with a guest who says the answer to that could be yes. Please welcome Nat Manny. Nat is president and CEO of Bestronics here here in Sa San Jose. San right? Jose. Glad to be here, Seth. Glad to have you here, Nat. All right, let's let me give you a little bit of personal history. When I when I bought my first personal computer, that was way back in 1977, and it was a kit, by the way. The components from the chips to the boards, the whole thing was all made here in the Silicon Valley. We made it all. If I buy a computer today, how much of it is made locally? Is any of it made locally? So personal computer, probably some of it, but not all of it. But majority of the other ones are made here in the Valley. A lot of the Valley, what we do, but personal computer, your example is quite right. It's not made here in the Valley anymore. Uh, yeah, that's correct. What, what, what about media? I mean, I used to buy hard disk, floppy disk. I remember shopping for the best brand of eight inch floppies. You remember those? Yes, uh, you know, and, and they were made here. They were actually made here. Made here. So the technology, actually, if you look at it, we have grown past the personal computer. So personal computer by itself, when it was a high value add sort of an item, it made sense for it to be made here. But for mass adoption, it needed to go to a place where there was a lot of volume capability involved, and that actually in turn helped Silicon Valley evolve into the next level of manufacturing, the advanced manufacturing, which is kind of what we do here in the Valley today. Well, can you give me some sense of how much there is of that? Because you know, I drive around the Valley, and all the buildings look pretty much the same to me. They're all these, you know, tilt ups, whatever, whatever they are. And I can't tell whether the guys inside are writing software or assembling boards or what they're doing. How, how much uh, manufacturing actually is there in the valley? There's quite a bit of manufacturing in the valley. In fact, if you look at San Jose, there's a stunning piece of statistic that it has six times the number of electronic manufacturing headcount than any other part of the U.S. So, which is kind of an amazing piece of data if you look at it. Uh, as we have grown from the personal computer to where we are today, there is a lot of high-end advanced manufacturing, some complicated things that are going on in the Valley that really essentially are feeding in the Valley ecosystem. And it is a very much a vibrant part of what we do today. Even if you take the example of the Apple iPhone, for example, everybody talks about how wonderful the software is. It is wonderful, everybody likes it. But the reality is what people get jazzed up about uh, every year after every year when they do the new announcement, it's the new hardware. That's what excites people. And it's, and it's all results in essentially coming from labs here that are designing those technologies, and those are the things that the Valley is good at. But why do I have this impression that we don't do any manufacturing here? I mean, uh, you said we have six times as, let me get this right, six times as much manufacturing as uh, six you know, the time, rest of Six times as much electronic manufacturing headcount in San Jose itself than any other part of the U.S. Okay, that's electronic manufacturing. Electronic manufacturing, okay. yeah. And, and overall, what percentage of the American economy is manufacturing? I now? think it's about 12 to 13 percent yeah. of the manufacturing, yes. In the 1950s, that would have been? That would have been higher. So, for example, <laughs> if, you, if you look at today, even China, which everybody equates to as kind of the largest manufacturing, say, industrial force, even for them, it's only about 30 percent of the economy. The next level up is Germany, which is at 20% of their economy is manufacturing. All right. Nat, you're the CEO of a company, Bestronics. It's right there on your shirt. I, I suppose that's just coincidence. But you're doing electronics manufacturing here. I mean, you're really putting together electronics? Why'd you do this? Wouldn't it be better just to have a company that designs products and then you send them over the internet to someplace in Asia and have them put together there? It's actually, uh, it's a question of what are things, if what's in the valley, what are people designing? Not everything can be made offshore, not everything can be made onshore. If, for example, all the products in the world were to be made in one location, that's just that's not gonna work. So each region of the world figures out what it does well. We in the valley are able to design complicated things. For that, we need an ecosystem. And this valley is, there's nothing like it in the valley which provides access to test engineers, software engineers, manufacturing process engineers, and all that. And that's how all these things come together. At a certain volume, certain products may need to go offshore, but majority of the work that we do for the complicated ones, they end up being here in the valley, and that's kind of what we do. 
I think if you were to grab the next 10 people off the streets of San Jose and ask them about, you know, electronics manufacturing, to begin with, they would assume that there's none here, I, su I suspect. And the other thing, they say, well, there's just no way we can compete because of the wage differential. Maybe you could give me some idea of the difference in the wages that, you know, somebody would get in China for putting electronics together and somebody at your place. I hope there's a difference. There's a big <laughs> difference, yeah, absolutely. In fact, one thing we have to look at is, Every, uh, the sound bites all seem towards going towards us compa uh, comparing us to China. But the real metric we had to look at is we had to look at Germany. Germany's labor costs are 33 percent higher than the U.S., yet as a percent of their GDP, they are about 20 percent versus U.S. is 12. There's a lot of Germany exports a lot of products, a lot of high-end uh, products, and that's if we want to look at an aspirational model, that's what I would look to as opposed to China. The labor cost is never going to, our labor cost is never going to be as low as China. No matter how much we do, that's not going to, that's not what our value is. Our value is in providing some really complex engineering support and then coming up with some products that actually make sense. And it kind of, Germany is a good example of how successful they are as an economy. Well, Germany trades on the fact that its products are perceived as being very high quality, very high quality. Uh, American products were once considered to be very high quality too. I don't know if they are today. I, I see some products, you know, they have a little American flag, proudly made in the U.S. Well, I, I'm glad that they were made proudly, but were they made well? And, <laughs> and, and do we have a quality advantage just in general? We'll get back to the electronics, but I'm just... A absolutely. In fact, a lot of the quality standards, if you look at it, the consistency is what you would find here. We have essentially an ecosystem that's it looks at data. We are essentially a fact-based management sort of economy, if you look at it. And for that, quality and data and metrics and all those things matter. So I would proudly say that whatever we make in the Valley is as good as anything else that's made out there because the fact that we have all these inspections and standards. And the other advantage is if you have a, f a factory that's far off, to send your quality engineer to supervise what's going on. They may look at samples. Here, they're right there. There's an issue. They come in, they get resolve it, and they can get those things solved quite, uh, quite easily. Let me just, just follow up a little bit on the labor business because, uh, as you point out, I mean, there's no way we're going to be able to compete on wages. It's always going to yeah. be lower somewhere else. But if I take a, a typical electronic product, and I don't know what's typical, people think in terms of consumer products like their phones, but what fraction of the cost of that thing is in the labor, putting it together? It's, uh, if you look at a personal computer, probably hardly three or four percent of it is in the labor content of it. But if you look at some of the other, most of the products that are in the valley, about 35 percent is labor content, about 65 percent is building materials. That's typically what the ratios are in, in the products that we essentially end up doing here. Now you pointed out that uh, having manufacturing here improves the ecosystem. Now, you know, that sounds good, it's green somehow, <laughs> the ecosystem. But what, what you're saying is that if I've got an idea for a new product, if it's being manufactured 10,000 miles away, I have a hard time interacting with the manufacturing process. And if I see, oh no, here's a bit of a glitch or here's an improvement, uh, there may be some sort of time delay or some other sort of delay. Give me the kind of product, give me an example, the kind of product that really would benefit to having the manufacturing plant in the same city as the design guys. Design, for example, I'll give an example. We at our company make a product, I, I wouldn't name the end customer because it's confidential, but essentially what we do is we do a very sophisticated positioning device that's used for survey equipment. It's got really sophisticated electronics. It ties the signals to essentially satellite-based GPS controls and is used for positioning and serving. It's the, the electronics assembly it goes into a box and believe it or not, this product actually goes ships to China. The Chinese, for their high-speed rail uh, infrastructure, use this product for that part of it. So essentially, I look at uh, manufacturing as a challenge in the sense that there's some interesting projects that we can essentially leverage the ecosystem and serve the world markets with that part of it. And as long as we remain focused on that, as opposed to saying, well, it's always going to be cheaper in China, at least cheaper elsewhere else, we'll have, we'll have a tough time kind of competing. But, so I look at that example. Yeah, but but that, that sounds like a very specialized thing. Uh, I mean, is manufacturing here going to be relegated to niche products? I mean, the kinds that, you know, well, only niche products are suitable for manufacturing here? Not, not niche products per se, but a lot of things, for example, the other thing is uh, if you're setting together a comp putting together a company today, your point about the best engineers that you want to have on the project, if they're on the phone at night talking to their offshore suppliers, 
the, they, and a long time, I've done this myself in the past, when you had a product, you know, you go get on a plane ride, you solve the problem, you don't come back three, four weeks later, that you can't do that anymore because the value is, you know, essentially you look at that part of it, these folks have interesting ideas to contribute, so you don't, so those kind of projects, they figure out how to do that, and then at a certain stage, maybe they can launch it and then launch it into high volume. And the IP protection is other thing that we talk about. Uh, there are a lot of projects where customers are concerned about IP protection, and for those sort of products, uh, obviously we have the best in intellectual property protection system anywhere in the world, so customers are comfortable working with a manufacturer and outsource manufacturers just as anybody else, knowing that their IP is going to be trusted. They know that they can follow the standards and all that part of it. So those things are clearly advantages for us here in the Valley. Is, is that a real problem that, you know, you send it overseas to be manufactured and then it gets knocked off? So some of it, yes, it is, and especially the consistency of it. They're, they're very concerned about, uh, like for example, you can look at some industry examples where some products that essentially were being made, like uh, components there, then all of a sudden you find out that those components are, you know, they're, they're IP. So the, the, the customer, the OEM, loses control of the IP. So we have, we have those examples before. Nat, about a year or so ago, I heard a local talk show host, guy up in San Francisco, discussing some manufacturing that Apple was going to bring back to the Valley. Do you, do you remember that story? Yes, yes. What, what, what were they going to bring back here, do you, do you recall? Yeah, they actually have uh, some level of early part of manufacturing that they were doing, and then they actually have a plant here in San Jose that they were doing that locally. And essentially it's, it's, it's more you know, of, of that certain types of projects, what they call NPR, early, early manufacturing, that's kind of what they're doing. Clearly the volume products, as we all know, are not made, not made here in the Valley. Well, the host asked his audience, he said, would you be willing to pay $50 more for your iPad if it were made in the U.S., right? And uh, did, did he get that price differential even approximately right? No, I, I, I don't, yeah. In, in fact, as consumers, we vote with a, with, a, with a wallet, which we should. In fact, your personal computer example, uh, the, I think the whole personal computer was enabled by some of that ecosystem actually moving offshore at that because that created a value chain, which we did that part of it. This drive is a good example. If we were making them all in the U.S., we could have never essentially have successfully been able to bring the price of the personal computer down. So those things had a value, so those high volume products, they actually never were here in the U.S. to begin with, especially disk drives. They, they went off and launched factories and here, here, meanwhile, we did the early part of the manufacturing, some of the very high end products. I used to work for IBM in the old days and they used to make disk drives right here in, yeah. in, in San Jose. And you know they, they were very successful at it for a while. <laughs> well, that 1977 personal computer I had, I eventually got a hard drive for it. That's right. I I was visiting a relative here and I bought one in Milpitas. I think it was made in Milpitas. Four hundred dollars, ten mega megabytes. Megabyte, that's ten right. megabytes. Well, okay. So that fifty dollar differential that's not even correct. Because most of the people who called in, they said, if my iPad if my iPad cost me fifty dollars more, but it was made here, I would go for the fifty bucks. To begin with, he was wrong about the fifty bucks. And secondly, I ask you was he, I mean, were the callers even being honest? They said that they would pay the additional money. Would they pay the additional they, money? They won't pay. The, we don't expect our customers to pay. I mean, I'm a consumer like anybody else. I won't pay $1 more. I look at the product value and that part of it. Is to, the, the idea is for Silicon Valley, essentially, is to find those products that essentially match what we need here and what are, what are inventors and what R&D folks are doing and the come up with an ecosystem that matches that part of it, and that's kind of what this valley is about. And I understand, you know, a large scale, I'm not trying to solve the U.S.'s manufacturing competitiveness or whatever, but I'm talking <laughs> about the valley, and valley, as long as we can all work together, which we do quite effectively with a lot of ecosystem partners, we actually do a great job, I think, uh, organizing ourselves in support of our OEM customers. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the, uh, the advantages of manufacturing here. Now, we, we are talking electronics, we're not, talking about cars, we, we do make cars here. Um, you were talking about the being nimble. It seems to me, I'm not in manufacturing, I actually have never been in anything involving manufacturing, but it seems to me, again, you've got this product, and if you've lost control over the manufacturing, that seems to me that that can't work in your favor. To begin with, it's very cumbersome, as you've already pointed out, you're on the phone, I mean, if it's being put together in India, that's 12 hours away, right? Nobody's awake there. That's right. right? So it's a one-day turnaround all the time. 
Uh, but beyond that, you want to you want to fine tune that manufacturing process, and it's very slow going. But the other thing is, those people, even if they're not knocking it off, you know, they're they're sitting there with all these manufacturing capability, and some of them are going to say, you know, we can design products too. That's right. Then you've just set up your competition. That's right. So yeah, I go, going yeah, when you when you go, if you got to take those in consideration. Certain countries and certain projects are better than that, so you have to be very careful when you evaluate it and how you, especially if you have IP that's very sensitive, you need to figure out how to guard band that. And those kind of worries, obviously, you don't have. You don't have here in the Valley. Are, are there any systematic changes in the economics of manufacturing that might bring, uh, bring more of it back to the U.S. in general? I mean, even aside from electronics, I'm thinking of things like transport, for example. I mean, it costs something to bring the product across the ocean. Yeah, transport would be another revolution. Also, the also I was thinking uh, we we need to look at how the industry, like for example, we have great universities here and we have great inventors. Most of them are focused on uh, incubators for software companies. And if we can have, we are talking about essentially putting together a hardware incubator uh, for for newer companies that essentially have access to the manufacturing and do that part of it. Those kind of initiatives, if we can essentially go look at as projects, they will actually create a lot of interest in the manufacturing part of it and get some uh, folks that are real brilliant designers to lo really look at things like what they need to do when the product gets to high volume. So those are kind of the things we need to kind of talk about as an industry, figure out how to collaborate, how to create an ecosystem, if you will, in order to, for the engineers and inventors to be able to see and launch their products. What about uh, technologies like 3D printing, for example? Now, that probably doesn't apply to what you're doing, but robotic assembly certainly does. And it, it, does that change the equation in any substantive way? Now, you know, you don't need armies of people putting parts together. You have machines doing all of that. Or you, you know, print the parts. Yeah, so 3D printing is great for early prototype samples and those things, but as far as getting a consistency of the product, it still weighs out there, uh, in, as, as you know. Uh, in terms of the robotics of it, the robotics always has to be evaluated against the, for example, it's probably easier to put an automated line to make 20 million iPads a quarter. But if you're making several, which a lot of changes, a lot of mixed changes and things like that, robotics generally are not as effective. <laughs> Okay, I, you know, manufacturing, when I was a kid, America made everything. This was something they loved to, to talk about, you know. We make it all. And of course, that was an artifice of the end of the Second World War. Most of our competitors had been flattened and, and, and that sort of thing. But people will argue today that manufacturing is important because manufacturing is what produced all those high-paying middle-class jobs. And it was the middle class that made America very stable. So when manufacturing is gone, these people would argue, so is the middle class. Others will say, no, 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 these people are just going to get white collar jobs. This is more in the realm of politics, but since you're in manufacturing, I'd, I'd like your take on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think ma uh, manufacturing is very relevant. It's not just the direct manufacturing jobs that are affected, but also folks that supply equipment, for example. They're making complex equipment, and if you don't have a manufacturing plant here, say in the Valley or any place else, then those equipment salesmen or equipment engineers, whatever, they're working on that part of it, their livelihoods are affected as well. So clearly, it's not just the direct manufacturing headcount, but the supporting ecosystem, what it does. That's what I think makes, makes a difference. You know, nothing against software engineers, but software engineers, they can essentially easily be transported from one part of the world to the other because they don't really need an ecosystem around uh, a robot other than having a fast internet content and maybe brains to go figure out how to, how to write the right stuff. But for manufacturing, you need essentially, uh, you know, the, that whole ecosystem uh, to, to essentially effectively work. So what do you say to people who say, look, you know, don't worry about it. We don't need to bolt stuff together anymore. Uh, we'll just all sit around and write apps and, and other software. Uh, I would just, again, show them their whatever their tablet of choice is, or smartphone of choice, don't you want something better? And you got to figure out how to learn how to do these things and look at what, how these things come about. And in you know, software alone, you know, God bless software engineers, but they can't run the internet. It needs the hardware and everything else around it. And we, you know. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. When I was in high school, they still had shop, right? You learned how to make things with your hands. That's right. And I look around at kids today, and I, you know, is anybody busy with ham radio or tinkering with their cars or doing anything that 
you know, might lead to a, a bit of insight into what's involved with manufacturing, or is, are those talents all going away? They're, they're obviously much less than what they were before. There's no disagreement with that, but I think because of this, uh, what we see is a resurgence in the Valley in terms of some of these new ideas. Uh, for example, recently we, the, the city of San Jose organized a manufacturing day, which they do it, and so we have kids coming from schools and colleges or whatever to kind of look at what a manufacturing environment looks like from a career point of view, whatever. And these are some of the things that we ought to be doing and educating in shows like this, for example. They have somebody like, like me sitting here talking about manufacturing. Uh, and I think it makes it important. Somebody's making a decision what they want to do. They come and check us out, check any other factories out. There's lots more interesting things goes on in a manufacturing factory than in a software lab. I mean, I'd rather do that if I was a kid. I'd rather do that than, than spend time you know, you know, st staring at you know, computer code all day. Th does a company <laughs> like Intel you know, bring in high school kids and let them see the plant? Probably they don't. They do actually. The, in the Intel in the Intel Museum, they actually. Uh, well, the museum, the, the museum, but museum, I mean, actually seeing the plant. Seeing the plant is in there. Yeah, plant, especially a plant electronic manufacturing, anything else, and lots more exciting stuff. And then they go look at how these things are. You know, not only manufacturing, but logistics. How do you manage changes? How do you manage all that part of it? It's just essentially, even though you're alive when you're when you're when you're in the manufacturing environment, and that's something that I think. Uh, and it's, it's a good thing to be around, I think. A lot of people say that uh, the 21st century is going to be the century of biology. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that, but we're finally understanding certainly human biology. And, and, you know, we're beginning to, I mean, there are biohack spaces here in the valley, right? You go in and you can make, I don't know, trees that glow in the dark or, or whatever. Uh, is there going to be any manufacturing associated with that, or do we just grow products? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, you'll see a lot of instrumentation that gets more sophisticated. Like the, the, when they talk about, if you talk to any of the bioinstrumentation companies, they say more and more information that's available closer to the doctor and the patient. So as opposed to sending in, for example, in the old days when you went to your dentist, you know, you did the x-ray, two weeks later the guy came back and said he had four missing teeth. Now <laughs> it tells you, you know, right away, right? Took an so, x-ray to tell that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so those kind of things, those technologies that bring the diagnosis and the analysis closer to the patient, those are some of the exciting things that I think we'll be working on. I think th they all involve some element of hardware, some element of technology around it. Yeah, but I mean, you might even build, I mean, you know, people talk about building computers that involve DNA and so forth. Sounds hard to read in and out to me, but you know, that you can actually use biology to build stuff. I don't, I don't know, I don't see it, but maybe it has, has a future there. Uh, robotics, isn't changing the landscape for electronics unless you're making a large number of the same device. Otherwise, the, the robot is too expensive, right? But, you know, what if the robots, I mean, 20 years down the line, uh, maybe the robots are a lot cheaper, are a lot more flexible, they, they can be, you know, retasked quickly? Yeah, it, it is definitely, the, even for certain tasks that, for example, uh, where some visual hand-to-eye coordination required in some sp specific a aspects, Robotics is generally better to do that part of it. But overall, if you really look at it, the scale that it requires to automate the factory around that part of it, the ROI metrics may work for certain products, but won't work for the vast majority of what we do because vast majority of what we do is actually high mix, configurable, changeable, that thing. And by the time you do all those different kind of variations, uh, if you're spending time looking at the robotics part of it, it's probably the, it's not cost. It's not going to cost. Effective. Okay, but still, you're not you're not just making prototypes, though, right? I mean, you build stuff that actually goes out in a box. Here's the product, right? That's right. That's right. And and how is Bestronics doing? I mean, are you growing? We are growing. Actually, we had a record quarter well, last quarter. We we moved into a building that was three times bigger uh, last year. We already are looking at a next building, a next couple of set of buildings. So we're actually doing uh, doing well, thanks uh, to all the all the customers that we have and the work that they appreciated what we have done for them. And, and presumably you have competition? Yeah, competition, and in fact, it's interesting, there's more, because of the fact that there's a lot of electronic manufacturing headcount, there's a lot of companies like us out there but what we do is we figure out, end of the day, this is a huge market. It's like there's a, there's a place for a Whole Foods, there's a place for a Safeway, there's a place for a small grocery uh, corner down the road. We have, it's a huge market, so we have to figure out what it is, a set of customers that we can work with and what can we do for them. For example, we as a company make sure that we never ever lose a customer. And those are some of the things we do to, in order to grow, grow our business, provide flexibility, service, the kind of things that they expect. And if we make a mistake, we, we work with them and correct it and go on. That's kind of what we do. 
And yeah, it's, it's a tough business. I mean, there's no, there's no, no two ways about it. It's competitive, but we, we like it. So well, they say that California is often touted as the leader of the country. You know, what, what happens here <laughs> happens here first, and then the rest of the country picks up. Uh, do you think that's going to happen in terms of a kind of a renaissance, if I can call it that, in electronics manufacturing? Uh, absolutely. In fact, you know, it's kind of ironic if you look at the, all the naysayers about California, they complain about taxes, about cost of living and everything else. But guess what? This is the economy that's relevant. The only, in my mind, the only economy that's relevant is Silicon Valley. It's because people have figured out how to essentially be, work together and solve problems. And to me, manufacturing is just, a, just one aspect of it. How we can go put together, work together, put together engineers, you know, physicists, chemists, and whatever that's needed in order to put together a solution. And there's no other, no better place in the world than, than Silicon Valley is. Well, okay, finally, Nat, I got to ask you the question. I'm sure you get asked all the time when you go to parties. You tell people what you do. You make things. You're actually in manufacturing. And people, of course, this is a hobby horse for a lot of people. A lot of Americans say, you know, we got to bring back manufacturing. Are we ever going to bring back manufacturing? How do you see it? How do you answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. I said we bring, we have to have manufacturing. Without manufacturing, you know, we, we, you know, what are we going to do, right? I mean, so we, 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 we will have manufacturing, more interesting manufacturing. Hopefully, we look at not just China, as we mentioned, look at countries like Germany, advanced countries, look at advanced manufacturing, and that's kind of how I think we can grow and improve the value chain. <laughs> well, manufacturing. Once America's pride, maybe the luster can come back. I want to thank you. Nat Manny, Manny, Nat Manny, and I also note this program was both planned and produced locally right here. It was manufactured in the Silicon Valley. Thanks very much to our expert KMVT staff and our uh, longtime hardworking producer, Susan Hubbard. And I'm Seth Shostak inviting you to join us next time for Silicon Valley Buzz. Good night. Thank you.